Today is March 23rd, 2020, and it is the start of the second week of nationwide school closures due to the coronavirus pandemic. We were originally only supposed to miss two weeks of school due to these mandatory closures, but this has now been extended by two more weeks to now last until April 9th. This really is just so crazy. The fact that we're all just sitting here in the middle of March, out of school and out of work, it just feels so strange. Since around last Wednesday or so, I had a feeling that the school cancellations were going to be extended. And because of this, I made sure to make one last trip to our classroom to pick up any last minute things that I might want to use in these video lessons while I had the chance. I made a video of that trip as well, and it is available on Chase Floyding's YouTube channel for anyone looking to reminisce about our classroom. Anywho, this all means that, at the very least, we're going to miss an entire month of school. Which is a very bad thing, since I'm already losing my mind, and it's only been one week. The quarantine is only one thing that's causing this to happen to me, though. The other is, paradoxically, the fact that I'm trying to make these video lessons. My goal was to release a new video lesson every single day for my students, but I've been having trouble doing this due to a problem that's been plaguing me for many years now. Perfectionism. I just cannot seem to let good enough be whenever doing anything creative in nature, and this often leads me to good extremes to try and create a perfect product. When it comes to making videos, this means a lot of redoing, refilming, and editing, which takes a lot of time. These are times of need, though, so I cannot let my perfectionist tendencies get the best of me. Nothing, not even perfectionism, can keep a good chef down, especially when it comes to teaching science during times of need. I will thus not give up on my goal of making sure that you keep learning science every single day by watching my video lessons. Note that I might start making shorter video lessons though to make up for any days that I might miss. I might also continue working on these when school starts again to give you an awesome video resource to use to learn about the science of viruses. I might also stop saying the date in these videos since, well, you know why. With that being said, hopefully you saw my second video lesson, which was about how to kill a virus. For today's video lesson, we are going to learn more in depth about something that can do just that, and that something is a vaccine. So get excited, because for today's video lesson, we are going to learn about the history of vaccines and just what a vaccine even is. I imagine most of you have gotten a vaccine before in the form of a shot at some point in your lives. And when you're a kid, this usually means getting some free candy, such as a lollipop, to help you deal with the pain. Vaccines are important because they can help you develop an immunity to viruses, which, if you've been watching my video lessons, are a lot like one type of lollipop, the Tootsie Roll Pop when it comes to their structure. Ironically, the last kind of candy that I filled the candy bear with before the closure was the Tootsie Roll Pop, which, if you think about it, looks a lot like a virus. Viruses consist of a nucleic acid, the Tootsie Roll Center, surrounded by a protein coat, which would be the candy coating. If a virus has also exited its host, the virus will also have a viral envelope made from the host cell's cell membrane, which in our Tootsie Roll Pop analogy would be the wrapper. This fact, the fact that viruses are made of several different parts, is the key to how vaccines are even possible. Vaccines are biological solutions injected into a living organism with a syringe designed to help organisms develop an immunity to an infectious disease by imitating the disease-causing agent, which oftentimes is a virus. The resulting imitation infection usually lasts for a few days, and while some symptoms of the actual virus can appear, 
if the vaccination is done correctly, these symptoms will cease once the body's immunity to it builds up. Anywho, recall that we learned in our second video lesson that your body's own immune system is one of the best ways to kill a virus or any other infectious agent. And this makes the vaccine an invaluable tool in helping us do just that. Not all vaccines are the same though, for there are several different kinds. The attenuated or weakened vaccine consists of active but weakened versions of the infectious agent, such as a virus. While the killed or inactivated vaccine uses parts of the infectious agent itself, such as a virus's proteins. There's also the toxoid vaccine, which consists of an inactivated toxin produced by an infection causing bacterium, which, contrary to popular belief, can also be stopped with vaccines. Finally, there is also the conjugate vaccine, which also helps stop infectious bacteria, but uses parts of the bacteria combined with proteins. Despite these technical differences, vaccines are simply biological solutions containing something derived from an infectious agent that can imitate an infection and thus activate your body's own immune system. When any kind of vaccine is injected into a living organism to initiate an imitation infection though, the organism's immune system responds to the weakened virus or virus parts the same way it would to a real virus gaining entry into its biological systems. This leads to the cells of the vaccinated organism signaling to increase the production of white blood cells, the immune system's top warriors, to fight off the infection. Macrophages, B lymphocytes, and T lymphocytes thus go into production to help fight off the imitation infection. The latter two are extremely important, since after the imitation infection has been defeated, the body is left with a supply of memory T lymphocytes, as well as some B lymphocytes that will remember how to fight that disease in the future. Vaccines also cause your body to increase its natural levels of white blood cells to fend off the threat of getting reinfected. But these levels sometimes decrease over time for certain vaccinations, thus causing some patients to need an additional dose of vaccination solution throughout their lives. The flu vaccine is sometimes used as an example of this, due to the fact that people often get a dose of it every year. But this is actually due to the fact that the influenza virus exists as a different strain every year. A better example would be the DTaP vaccine that children often get a booster shot for. Vaccines are an incredibly important part of our healthcare systems today, for they prevent us from getting some of the most terrible diseases of all time, such as measles, polio, and even varicella, better known as chickenpox. A type of pox virus though, the incredibly harmful smallpox virus is what led to the development of the process of vaccination. The smallpox virus, also called the variola virus, causes a variety of symptoms, but it is most known for causing a lesion-filled rash to form on the body. This virus has been present among human civilizations for millennia, and it was the Chinese who first tried to find a way to prevent it way back in the 10th century. They used a process called inoculation, which today is synonymous with vaccination, but back then this term meant taking infected tissue, such as a scab or some pus, from a mildly infected smallpox patient, drying it out in the sun, and then using the weakened tissue to infect a healthy person. The subsequent infection was usually less severe in nature, and if the person survived, then they would acquire a level of immunity to smallpox. This process, also called variolation, due to it mainly being used to prevent the spread of smallpox, aka the variola virus, had some success which led to many subsequent societies attempting to expand on these principles in hopes for a concrete way to prevent smallpox. While there were reported cases of people obtaining immunity to smallpox using this method of self-infection by the infected, it wasn't until the late 1700s when a scientist named Edward Jenner made the first successful smallpox vaccine using a small amount of cowpox virus, 
a similar virus that only affected cows. Jenner, now known as the most famous figure in vaccination science, hypothesized that farmers, who tended to not get smallpox as much, developed an immunity to it from working with cows that had contracted cowpox. After developing his vaccine and coining the term after the Latin word vacca, which means cow, Jenner put his ideas to the test by vaccinating an eight-year-old boy named James Phipps. Despite being successful in immunizing James Phipps, Jenner's findings were rejected by the Royal Society, and his method of inoculating people with virus-laden pus and scabs from sick farm animals was deemed disgusting and wrong. As is often the case in science, though, and in life, persistence in the pursuit of one's goals is crucial to success. So Jenner kept trying, and after successfully vaccinating his own baby boy and a few other people, his ideas finally caught on and he became famous for his discovery. Edward Jenner is credited for not only inventing the process of vaccination, but also helping end the terror that was smallpox. Smallpox is now essentially completely eradicated, with the only remaining samples existing in a few secured locations. Note, though, that debate exists over whether or not smallpox should be completely eradicated. Potential research is given as a reason to keep smallpox in small amounts, but potential risks include the threat of it being used as a biological weapon. Note as well that smallpox can potentially remain active for several years in storage. There have been a handful of recorded incidents in which old solutions or old tissue samples containing the smallpox virus have been found and shown to contain active smallpox virus particles. The smallpox vaccine, which uses a new method involving a bifurcated needle, is also stockpiled if this ever does become an issue again. Edward Jenner died in 1823. But a year prior, in 1822, another famous scientist in the field of vaccination was born, Louis Pasteur. Mainly known today for his process of pasteurization, a process that uses heat to treat water, milk, and other food products to kill bacteria and extend shelf life, Pasteur's work began with an investigation into the cause of why food spoiled. This led him to making several discoveries related to how bacteria and other microorganisms can cause disease. His continued studies then led to him developing several attenuated or weakened vaccines, which, if you recall, consist of weakened versions of the infectious agents themselves. These vaccines were used to fend off a variety of conditions common during Pasteur's time, such as foul cholera, anthrax, and rabies. The history of vaccines is truly worthy of an entire book, and while there are several other important figures worth mentioning in order to fully appreciate the history of this process, with the goal of being a bit more succinct, I am going to conclude this video lesson by mentioning my personal favorite, Jonas Salk. Jonas Salk is another very famous scientist in the field of vaccination, right up there with Jenner and Pasteur for he is known for creating the first successful vaccination against the dreaded polio virus. Polio, short for poliomyelitis, is a virus that destroys nerve cells in the spinal cord, causing muscle degeneration and paralysis. This can also lead to difficulty breathing due to the diaphragm not being able to contract leading to the invention of the iron lung as a means of keeping the infected alive by helping them breathe. Polio is by far one of the most terrible diseases our world has ever faced. And due to its severity, the fact that it can be transmitted through infected people, food, or water, and the rapid onset of symptoms, a vaccination had to be made. Jonas Salk was the first to make such a vaccine, releasing his findings in 1955 for how to make this type of inactivated vaccine. Unfortunately, this came after millions of people had already suffered from the disease, most notably President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who tried to hide the health impacts of his condition from the public during his presidency. Salk became famous for his vaccine and the incredible amount of good it brought to our world, 
And while he was not the kind of person to desire fame, he did use his platform to better the world and start the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, which continues to perform biomedical research to this day. Research involving vaccines in particular is a very active area of biomedical research, and never has this been more relevant than right now. The coronavirus currently has no vaccine, but work is being done to create one, possibly using hydroxychloroquine, a drug mainly used to treat malaria, which is actually caused by a protozoan parasite and not a virus. At this time though, a vaccine is unlikely to be ready for another 12 to 18 months. Well, that's all I have to share with you today about vaccines and the history of them. Hopefully you learned about what a vaccine is and how it can teach your body to fight off a virus. Like I keep saying as well, we must keep learning through all of this. We are the scientific minds of the present that will be called upon to develop the vaccines of the future. There are going to be a lot more of these video lessons in the coming days due to the nationwide school closures going on. So please subscribe to Chase Floyd Inc. and turn on notifications so you'll be able to see every new video lesson as they're released. While you're here, please check out all my other great videos as well, such as my piano videos. And share this video with any friends that you think might like it. It is going to be an interesting couple of weeks, so you got to use your time wisely and try to learn something new every single day. With that being said, bell or no bell, we still work. Bell for bell. In Mr. Floyd's class, even during crazy times like these. So, I hope you learned a lot today, and we'll see you all tomorrow for our exciting video lesson. Nothing can keep a good chef. As I was saying, nothing can keep a good ship down. Nothing can keep a good ship down, especially when it comes to teaching science during times of need. Candy! Candy. Are a lot like one of these Tootsie Roll Pops when it comes to their structure. Ironically, 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 the la ironically, the last type of candy. The Tootsie Roll Pop. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? Maybe the Candy Bear knows. Tell us, Candy Bear. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop? One, two, three. Oh. Ah. I take the wrapper off with these teeth. It's not going to work, okay? These teeth are not meant to have candy. Look how white they are. Candy bear! Mmm. That's one happy candy bear. Load it up. Still half full. More than half full. Got plenty left. This is the good do now candy right here. Yeah, you get one right, a hard scientific math do now. Get yourself a free piece of candy. 
We had gummy bears, we had Starburst, we had Mike and Ike, so that didn't really work out that well because they started to melt and congeal on the bottom. We cleaned it out though, don't worry. A um, whole bunch of other things too. In the candy bear. Mainly uh, gummy bears though. But, uh, let's see here, you got a whole bunch. Glad I saved the bag too, as I often do. <laughs> Candy mess. It's everywhere. I found a starburst. No. The gremlins are going to come out now and eat the candy I spilt. Ugh. Candy bear has no eyes. If somebody picked them off. I will say though, on the lid, on the candy bear's lid, it says, Mr. Floyd's gummy bears and candy and stuff. Candy bear. I hope you're using your time wisely in studying the science fusion book. The candy bear. He wants you to. He'll feel better. And maybe you'll even get some candy from him. Who knows? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a sister roll pop? Maybe William knows. Well, get over here. Your presence is Requested. Here we go, Will. Keyboard cat, Will. That being said, bell or no bell, we still work. Hey, Will. Will's returned. Come here. Come Good old William. William's best cat ever had. And never will. With that being said, Bell or no bell, we still work. Ooh. 
Hairs everywhere. I brought over here twice. Nothing, not even perfectionism, can keep a good chef down, though, especially when it comes to teaching science during times of need. <laughs> 